This is an NBC Connecticut special presentation. Welcome to Kids Connection. Proudly brought to you by ACES. Hi everyone, my name is Keisha Grant. I'm a news anchor for NBC Connecticut. That means I bring the news into your home every single day. But today, we're gonna do something a little different. I know a lot of you are at home right now, just like me and my children, Arabella and Grant. So we have a super fun show just for you. We have a fun art project. We'll take you behind the scenes of Mystic Aquarium and you'll learn all about New London. Are you ready? Are you guys ready? Yeah. yeah. We're ready. Here we go. Thanks for joining us on the Craft Corner. This is Mike and Molly. We call it M&M's Little Craft Corner. And we are here today to try to make something called a... Hope Stone. What is a Hope Stone? Hope Stones are giving people joy. So we want to bring a little joy to you. So these are these little Hope Stones. We're going to make see these cute little pictures on them. Yep. We're going to show you how to make two different designs. This little swirly one too. And you can even add some googly eyes. All right, so what do you think you're gonna make first? I think the first one is gonna, I'm gonna do is, since people have to wash their hands a lot, I'm gonna make one that says wash your hands and a picture of people washing hands. And all you need is some washable paint. Some Sharpies. And then some stones, which you can get in your yard. Pretty simple. Let's get started. Woohoo! In addition to just using Sharpies, you can also use paint and create something really cool like this. So see all this great drizzly kind of stuff on here? Molly's going to show us how to make that. So what do you do first? First thing you do is you take white paint, you uncap the white paint, yep. and then you take it and you, and you pour it on your rug. Okay. You really pour it because you want it to have a bunch of wet paint. And so when you're done with the scribbling process, it'll take me a couple minutes, but when you're done with it, um, you're going to want to grab some toothpicks and a different color of paint. Is that not too much paint? No, because we want to try... Oh, you want it to be thick? It is a lot of paint, but I'm just trying my best to aim correctly. Okay. Because... But can I spread it out or no? Yeah, you should spread it out. Or at least get it dripping down to the, the side over here? Yeah. All right, so. The next thing you do, once you're done with all your white paint, you have to put it over here. All right, get it out of the way. And then you take a different color of paint, and this instance we're using green paint, cool colors. And then you cap your green paint. You want to use a smaller amount because you're going to spread it out with some toothpicks. Dad, you take one toothpick, I'll take another, and we'll swirl them around. Okay. You can just swirl it? Yep. Basically, we do. You can make like little, little like, Designs. Yeah. It's best to do it when both paints are wet because then you can really spread it out. Oh, that looks cool. And then, does it take a longer time to dry? Once you're done swirling, you leave it on a place to dry. And then, once you're done, once it's done, it can look something like this. One of the best parts about Hope Stones is that they put smile, smiles on people's faces. And we're going to give our neighbor one. Today on All Around Connecticut, we're taking a trip to the shoreline. And with the help of Drone Ranger, you're going to see just how beautiful Connecticut's coastline really is. Places like Milford, Stonington, and Mystic all have their own charm. And living close to the water is special for dozens of towns dotted across the shoreline. One of the things that makes Connecticut unique is that our shoreline is part of Long Island Sound which is actually a tidal estuary. A tidal estuary is a body of water that consists of both fresh and salt water. Connecticut's three major rivers, the Connecticut River, the Housatonic River, and the Thames River make up to 90% of the fresh water that flows into the Sound, while the salt water flows in from the Atlantic Ocean. Long Island Sound is home to dozens of species of animals that you might recognize, like the harbor seal, and maybe some you don't recognize, like the horseshoe crab. Today, we'll be flying high over one of Connecticut's most important port cities, New London. 
Chartered as a city back in 1784, New London was a major center of trade in New England during the 19th century. It was one of the busiest whaling ports in the world, which helped establish New London as one of the most important cities during the Industrial Revolution. While still busy, New London has transformed over the years. It is now home to the United States Coast Guard Academy, as well as a number of incredible lighthouses and attractions. Let's check some out. One of New England's finest beaches can be found right here in New London. It's called Ocean Beach Park. The park opened in 1940 and is home to Sugar Sand Beach, which means it has very soft white sand great for building sandcastles. The 50-acre park sits along Long Island Sound and has a half-mile long boardwalk, an Olympic-sized swimming pool, water slide, amusement park, arcade, miniature golf, and much more. Standing tall at the entrance of New London Harbor is New London Harbor Light. First constructed in 1760, it's the oldest and tallest lighthouse in all of Connecticut and Long Island Sound. Since it was first built, more than 19 headkeepers have kept the tower lit. But in 1912, New London Harbor Light became automated. Nowadays, the United States Coast Guard operates the lighthouse, and they say from the top of New London Harbor Light, you can see more lighthouses than from any other place on Earth. Built nearly 150 years later, New London's Ledge Light is one of the last lighthouses built in New England. Unlike any other lighthouse you'll ever see, Ledge Light is truly a sight to behold. When it was first lit, the New London Day, a local newspaper, reported that you could see the light up to 18 miles away. For nearly 50 years, members of the United States Coast Guard were stationed at Ledge Light. Three sailors would spend up to three weeks in the lighthouse before being allowed to head back for a few days on shore. While New London is no longer the center of whaling and trade in the world, it is still an important part of Connecticut history and a great Connecticut city. And thanks to Drone Ranger, you were able to see it all from the sky. Coming up next, do you love going to the beach? We'll show you how you can bring the beach home by making your own sand in a fun science experiment. Hi kids, I'm NBC Connecticut's first alert meteorologist, Darren Sweeney, and this is my dog, Bentley. Say hi, Bentley. And this is your weather trivia. Our first question is, what is a scientist who studies the weather called? Here's a hint. I just used the word when I introduced myself. The answer is meteorologist. Okay, next. What is the longest, sunniest day of the year called? The summer solstice or the winter solstice? The summer solstice. And finally, many people know spring has arrived when blank start to bloom. I'll have that when we come back with more of NBC Connecticut's Kids Connection. watching Kids Connection on NBC Connecticut. Welcome back. Before the break, we asked, many people know that spring arrived when blank start to bloom. The answer is flowers. And I hope you get to enjoy some time outside and see some flowers and enjoy spring in Connecticut. Hey everyone, meteorologist Josh Singardelli here with your weekly science lesson. So far we've learned about clouds and different types of precipitation that we see here in Connecticut. But this week we are going to be focusing on the sun. We'll talk about how powerful it is and why it's so incredibly important to protect yourself from the sun. Let's start with some basics. The sun is a star located in the center of the solar system. Did you know that the sun is approximately 93 million miles away from Earth? This is actually incredibly important. The reason it's so important is because if we were any closer, it would be too hot to support any life. And if we were further away, it would be too cold to support any life. And the sun is really, really hot. In fact, it's nearly 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The sun provides energy to every living organism on Earth. 
But now let's talk about why it's so incredibly important to protect yourself from the sun when you're outside and especially when you're heading to the beach. The sun's ultraviolet rays can be harmful to your skin without the proper protection. That's why sunscreen was invented. Sunscreen absorbs the UV rays to help protect your skin. Have your parents help you determine what kind of sunscreen to use and how to apply it. It's also important to determine the proper sun protection factor or SPF. A higher SPF absorbs more UV rays while a lower SPF absorbs less UV rays. As we know, summer will be here before we know it. But if you want to get your hands in the sand right now, my colleague meteorologist Caitlin McGrath has a fun at-home experiment you can try today. That's right, Josh. We're bringing the beach inside today and making sunshine sand. For this project, you'll need white vinegar, baking soda, food coloring, I chose yellow, for sunshine, a small bowl, a straw, and a baking pan or a shallow container. First, you're going to take your baking soda and fill the bottom of your pan. Next, you'll mix your vinegar and your food coloring in your small bowl. Then you'll use your straw to drop your vinegar mixture on top of the baking soda. And watch as it boils up. Keep doing this until most of your baking soda is yellow. You want the baking soda to absorb all of the vinegar. And the last step, you get to get messy. Use your hands to mix it all together and you get your sunshine sand. We asked you to let us know what you've been up to at home. Send us your photos and videos. You might see them right here on NBC Connecticut. Coming up, get ready to learn about whales, sharks, and penguins, thanks to our friends at the Mystic Aquarium. There is some really interesting marine life living right here in Connecticut at Mystic Aquarium. The aquarium is proud to offer free and fun online activities for you to do while you're at home. But first, let's learn about some of the cool animals that live there. Starting with beluga whales, they are found in the northern hemisphere in Arctic and subarctic waters. The estimated average size for an adult male beluga is 12 to 15 feet long, weighing 1,600 to 2,500 pounds. Females average 11 to 13 feet in length, weighing 1,100 to 2,000 pounds. They can live between 35 and 40 years. Belugas typically form groups called pods or schools and can travel with up to a dozen other whales. The word beluga comes from a Russian word meaning white. Their white color acts like a camouflage in the icy Arctic waters. And did you know beluga whales communicate through the different sounds they make through their blowholes? Research shows belugas even have their own language and they can turn one half of their brain off at any time when they sleep so the other half stays just awake enough to remind them when to breathe. Next up, African penguins. The African penguin is a warm climate species. African penguins can stand about two feet tall and weigh between seven and 11 pounds. At a zoo or aquarium, they can live into their late 30s or early 40s. In the wild, they typically live to be around 15 years old. African penguins can swim up to 15 miles per hour. They're a species of bird, which means they have feathers and lay eggs, but penguins are one of very few birds that don't fly. The African penguin has a black beak, black feet, and a single band across its chest. Their colors help to camouflage them in the water. Now it's time to learn about sharks. There are eight different species of sharks at Mystic Aquarium. The two you'll see here are the sand tiger shark and the nurse shark. Sharks are believed to have been around for more than 450 million years. They are very important to the health of the ocean's ecosystems. 
They are a predator that helps control the populations of smaller predators and allow ocean habitats like coral reefs and kelp forests to thrive. Nurse sharks are found in the warm, shallow waters. Female nurse sharks average seven and a half to nine feet in length and weigh 165 to 230 pounds. They are slightly larger than males. They live around 25 years. Nurse sharks get their name from the sucking sound they make when hunting for prey in the sand. Moving on now to the sand tiger shark. They are found in warm waters throughout the world's oceans. Sand tiger sharks can grow between six and a half to 10 and a half feet in length and weigh between 200 and 350 pounds. Sand tiger sharks look ferocious with their large bodied and full mouth of sharp protruding teeth, but despite their appearance, they are not an aggressive species. They usually live around 15 years. Sand tiger sharks get their name because they tend to stay around the shoreline. Those are just some of the pretty awesome animals. We thank you so much to Mystic Aquarium for sharing that amazing video and teaching us about beluga whales, African penguins, and sharks. For now, you can learn more about them at home. You can watch professionals take care of the animals every single day on Mystic Aquarium's Facebook page. And parents and teachers can sign up for weekly resource email, and they also have fun email coloring pages. Have an adult visit NBCConnecticut.com and search Kids Connection to find out more. There's another kind of shark in the ocean called a lemon shark. And a local Connecticut author wrote a great book about one. Stay tuned for story time, coming up next. You're watching Kids Connection on NBC Connecticut. Now it's story time. Welcome back, everyone. I have a very exciting book to share with you today. We're going to meet Finn. Finn is a lemon shark who's looking for somebody to play with. And what makes this book extra special is the author is from right here in Connecticut. Jenna Grzydzki used to be a teacher in Avon in Southington, and now she is a full-time writer. I checked out her website. Looks like she's a big fan of animals because she has a lot of stories where animals are the central characters. So let's read Mrs. Grzydzki's book, Finn Finds a Friend. Life was boring at the bottom of the ocean. Boring, boring, boring. Finn wiggled and waggled back and forth, trying to convince his brothers and sisters to play with him. Like most lemon sharks, his brother and sister pups spent their days laying completely still on the ocean floor, their flat heads and broad snouts camouflaging them in the sand. Not Finn. He blew bubbles, he swam upside down, he counted barnacles, but it was no fun playing by himself. One early morning, Finn went in search of a friend. He hadn't swum very far when he came across a creature wearing a shell. He swam up to the animal. I'm Finn. Would you like to play with me? The turtle darted into a nearby rock cave. Hide and seek, said Finn. I love that game. Finn swam through the weeds. He nosed behind boulders. He wriggled into the rock cave until finally, I found you. You can come out now. No way. I don't want to be shark food, called the turtle but I'm not here to eat you, I just want to play. The turtle peeked out, not taking any chances, he said before disappearing into the cave again. Disappointed, Finn swam on. He came across some strange animals, swimming and splashing. They didn't have tails or fins like his, but they were making friendly sounds. Pasting on his brightest smile, he sped toward those creatures. As he got closer, a scream pierced the air, and he heard cries of, Shark! They're happy to see me, Finn thought. The closer Finn got, the faster they swam away. This is awesome, said Finn. They want to play tag. Soon, a loud, whirring noise filled the air, and waves rocked Finn back and forth. Where did they go? Didn't they understand that I just wanted to play tag? I'm not giving up, vowed Finn. But finding a friend who could see past his sharky appearance was harder than he thought. His smile drooped. His fin sagged. Finn continued swimming until two creatures diving in and out of the water caught his attention. One more chance, Finn thought. Hi, I'm Finn. Would you like to be my friend? You're a shark, the larger one replied. We can't be friends with you. Echo, let's go. Finn turned around, ready to glide home. He hadn't gotten very far when he heard a cry from behind. 
Luna, help me. Echo's tail was tangled in seaweed. Finn had an idea. I can help. He swam up to Echo, teeth bared. He's going to eat me, she shrieked. Wow, you weren't going to eat me. You were trying to help. Thank you for saving my sister. You're welcome. I was looking for someone to play with, not eat. We know that now. I'm Luna. This is my sister Echo. It's nice to meet you. Would you like to play? Sure. What do lemon sharks like to do? Finn smiled. Probably the same things that you like to do. OK, let's have a race, Luna suggested. Last one of the sea anemone is a rotten egg, cried Echo. Finn hurried after his new pals, his heart flipping. He had a whole list of games they could play next. Now, Finn's story is fiction, but lemon sharks are real. They may look scary, but they're not considered dangerous to people. They mostly eat bony fish, mollusks, and crustaceans. Dolphins are not on their menu. And no, lemon sharks do not eat lemons. Again, a great reminder that we can't make judgments about people based on what they look like. That's just a great story. And to find out more about Finn and this local author, ask an adult to go to NBCConnecticut.com and search Kids Connection. You're also going to find a link to coloring pages of Finn you can download there. We hope you enjoyed our show. Everything you saw today can be found on the NBC Connecticut YouTube channel. So grab an adult and you can watch again. Thanks for watching Kids Connection.